to talk about my big toe. Well, now that I've got your attention, it's not my big toe. It's my big toe written by nuclear physicists in the language of contemporary Western culture. Unifying science and philosophy, physics, metaphysics, mind and matter, purpose and meaning, and the normal and the paranormal, the entirety of human experience, including both our objective and subjective worlds, are brought together under one seamless scientific understanding. And who will decipher all this for us? Tom Campbell in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Tom Campbell began researching altered states of consciousness at Monroe Laboratories in the early 1970s. We'll talk a lot about that tonight. He experiments with and explores subjective and objective minds for the past 30 years or so. Tom's been focusing on scientifically exploring properties, boundaries, abilities of consciousness. He is a scientist. He is a physicist. And for the past 20 years has been at the heart of developing U.S. missile defense systems as well. Our special guest tonight on Coast to Coast, Tom Campbell. Hey, Tom, welcome to the program. Hi, George. Glad to be here. And likewise. Now, my big toe, when I first saw that, I said, what the heck is he writing about? Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Uh, my big toe. The, the toe in my big toe is a capital T, capital O, capital E. It's an acronym for theory of everything. It's a physics term that I guess most physicists are aware of. And, and, and soon we all will be. Yeah, it means an overarching theory, uh, a theory. You know, physicists, starting with Einstein and his unified field theory, tried to come up with a toe, a theory of everything that explained all of physics. So it explained quantum mechanics and relativity and, and classical mechanics and all of the, the various branches of physics, all explained by just one you know, set of equations, one understanding of how reality worked. Well, that's a, that's a toe in physics speak. Now, mine's a big toe. And the difference between a toe and a big toe is that a big toe has to also explain the paranormal as well as the normal. It has to explain the physical as well as the non-physical. It has to explain the subjective as well as the objective. So a big toe needs to explain everything, basically, that's in your experience. And, and you believe that, though, the worlds between the physics and metaphysics are very important, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Physics is a, very narrow, is a very narrow concept. It deals with only that tiny slice of reality that we call physical. Our reality is a much larger thing than that. Tell me a little bit about your work at the uh, Monroe Laboratories. Uh, Bob Monroe, uh, well, I, I think, one of the greatest astral projectors uh, in uh, his institute now, still uh, just doing what it does well. But how did you get involved in that? Well, um, I was a young, a young physicist. Uh, just newly out of graduate school, had my first job. The fellow I worked for tossed this book at me, and it was Journeys Out of the Body. And he uh, said, here, read this. Well, you know, he was the boss, so I did what he said, and I read it. Next question was, well, what do you think? And I said, well, if this is true, that's really amazing. You know, that, that's, a, that's fantastic. If it's not true, it's just some guy hustling books, then, you know, that's another story. But how do you ever find out? How do you know? What's true and what's not true? About three or four months later, uh, my boss comes to me and says, how would you like to go visit this guy? As it turns out, I was working in Charlottesville, Virginia, for Army Technical Intelligence at the time. And okay. Bob's uh, house and his lab were just uh, at Crozet at that time, a place called Whistlefield Farms. Um, that's not where he's located now, but that's where he was then. And he was in the process of trying to study the out-of-body phenomena. He had had this thing just happen to him. Nothing he tried to, to uh, learn to do. It just happened. At first, he thought maybe he was going nuts, that uh, it was a psychological trick. He studied that issue, um, got with Charlie Tart and some others, and, and decided that, no, he was perfectly sane. These things were just happening. And then he just started to collect evidence where he would go places and do things and interact and realize that, there was information he was collecting that was outside of himself. It wasn't just the tricks of his imagination. And then he wanted to study it. Well, what is it? What, where are these places? What is this reality? How do you, you know, what does it mean? How do, how do I get there? He wanted to, to make this investigation credible. And one of the ways to make it credible was to get some credible scientific talent in to have good protocol, to study it, hopefully come up with techniques that would make it so that uh, anybody 
could do it. He didn't like the idea that it just happened to him. He wanted to put it on the map where it was something that, that the average person could experience and that it could be controlled. Well, I ended up out of this, this house at about that, that time and uh, just, just to talk and chat. And we were all sitting out on the deck of this lab that he had just started but hadn't really got going, had no equipment mm-hmm. in it, just was basically an empty building. And he said, you guys are a bunch of scientists and engineers. Any of you want to help, you know, put this thing together? Boy, my hand shot up in the air right away. And I said, well, look, you teach me what you know about out of body. And, you know, I'll take care of the of doing the science for you. And that was a deal for the next almost decade. That was like 1972, basically. And up through just about 1980, uh, you know, it was Bob and I and a few others put together Monroe Laboratory. We did all the equipment. We soldered the wires. You know, we we put it all together. And then after we do that sort of work for an evening, we'd get in these in these little booths that he had, and we were the guinea pigs. And he would proceed to do his part of the bargain, which is teach us how to do out of body, how to control it, how to do it whenever we wanted to, and, and try to, to study it from firsthand experience because it was his idea. That was the only way to study it. If you study it academically, you're only going to get so far. You need to have the personal experience. So that's kind of what connected us. You know, once you get started on a path like this, once you realize what what it is you're dealing with, that reality is really bigger than the physical reality that you that you're aware of, then you don't turn back. There's no other place to go but forward. One thing leads to another, and what some. 35 years later, you know, here I am still doing it. <laughs> was he able to teach you, Tom, how to leave your body? Were you successful in doing that? Oh, yes. Uh, it was myself and, and uh, Dennis Menerick, actually, were the two of us. I was a physicist. Dennis Menerick, Dennis Menerick was a, an electronics engineer. He did teach us. He took us there and brought us back. He taught us. He worked with us. And, you know, we did that for probably close to a year. It, it kind of was a breakthrough for both Dennis and I. It became real common to uh, be able to go out of body. You know, we would do experiments while we were doing, while we were out of body. We were collecting data. We were trying to, uh, you know, bracket the experience. So we had EKGs and we had GSRs and other kinds of monitoring equipment on us uh, to try to see what, what uh, physical functions we could track, whether we could tell whether somebody was having out of body. But, yes, he did teach us. It's, uh, it's really not that difficult a thing to learn, if, you know, if you uh, work at it. Well, you know, I had one when I was 11 years old, Tom. I haven't been able to duplicate it, but reading uh, Robert's works, he was able to do this at will probably better than anybody during his era and since. And I just admired the fact that he was able to convey that kind of information to everybody. I didn't know how elaborate his scientific end was with you and some of the others. did you come away from this, let's say after a year, marveled with what was going on? Or I, I guess, how did you feel after about a year of doing that? Well, I tell you, uh, once I started it, my attitude was just, just science. You know, let's go see what happens and keep the science straight up. You know, then call it as it, as it comes, open-minded, but very skeptical. And I think Dennis was the, was the same. Bob worked with us, and uh, we got to where we could, you know, enter these altered states pretty much at will. And then eventually we got to where we were doing out of body pretty much at will. But I wasn't entirely convinced yet. It wasn't some sort of uh, function what? going on inside my head. It's like, right. how do you know it's out there and not in here? You know, how do you know it's not in your head? How do you know that you're really going out into an objective other reality? That question plagued us. And I think the thing that, that uh, turned that around was, was after well, it was probably almost a year, Dennis and I decided that we would do, and you know, Bob was, of course, part of this, that we would uh, go out of body together, that we would both uh, go out of our body separately. Now, Bob had us in these soundproof, shielded little rooms, and then he had microphones dangling down you know, above our, our mouths mm-hmm. so that he could, he could hear us, and we had earphones on so we could hear him. But we couldn't hear each other. Dennis and I were totally isolated, you know, by, by sound. It was soundproof 